Hey, uh, folks, welcome aboard. Thank you so much. I was just at the most inconvenient of times. I keep getting pop-ups on my phone. And I'm thinking, what, what are these? You have awards waiting? And then I remember I was with Berkeley over the weekend. My six-year-old uh, grandson, who, he and Rex, I'm so madly in love with those boys. And they're adding, well, you guys, you probably know this because you're probably grandparents also. But they're adding just pages and pages of these games, you know, uh, flurry cars, uh, desert riders, police pursuit. They're adding these games. And then I'll be in a meeting or I'll be working on something and it pops up, hey, you scored 150 points. And it just, instead of erasing them, it makes me smile. It reminds me of Friday. Uh, we uh, babysat uh, the boys and uh, man, did we have fun. That is just, and we watch Wild Birds 2, John. If you haven't seen Wild Birds 2, you have to see it. Okay, welcome aboard. Thank you for joining me today. Now on to some serious business. <clears throat> today I wanna talk with you about a couple of things. And I'm gonna start with pain. You know, I've published on this. I, I really believe that much, let me get this for you. I think this would be the good way of starting. John, do you have that magazine cover, Inflammation? Remember that one that, um, I think I have it right here. Inflammation, ouch, pain. Uh, ta, ta, ta. Well, it's one of, my, one of my magazine covers, but it was Time Magazine some time ago, and it said, <clears throat> found or discovered the cause, uh, you know, could this be linked into cancer and Alzheimer's disease and heart disease and so forth? And then it talked about the word inflammation. I'm so far beyond that. And this was only a decade ago or so. Time Magazine or Newsweek, one of the magazines had this on their cover. I'll see you guys. Have a good one. Um, there, thank you, John. The secret killer, you know, the link between cancer and Alzheimer's and so And the secret killer, folks, was inflammation right? You and I call it swelling, okay? Um, they, you know, medicine always has a different name for everything to confuse the innocent, okay? So inflammation and swelling is the same thing. Imagine you're just a mass of adipose, you know, of, of fat tissue and muscle tissue and other tissue, striated tissues. And inside all of those tissues are little tiny threads we call nerves, and they communicate with each other through a uh, an electrical conduit called a synapsis, right? What happens when those muscles, when you're, you know, just pushing yourself and, and, uh, and they get sore and you're doing core work and rear work and leg work, you're pushing on those nerves, right? Um, and that, if left that way, it's one thing to work out, right? It's a whole other thing um, to not work out and have pain. I read something the other day that blew me away. I was prepping for a new advertiser we have on TV, and he's a local guy. He's a chiropractor. A politician here in this town uh, came to me. I saw him at a, a shop, and I said, how are your migraines? He said, boom. Really? Uh, he couldn't move his right arm. How, how's your right arm? Boom. What'd you do? So I went to Dr. Brunk. I didn't know this guy. Went to Dr. Brunk and uh, he did stem cells on me, okay? Now, automatically I got a problem. I think stem cells, I think aborted fetuses, I shut it off immediately, okay? Don't wanna go there. It's like much that's happening in the world right now. Just wanna stay out of that. I wanna laugh, I wanna watch Laurel and Hardy, I wanna work out, I wanna swim. I don't wanna think about um, the things that, you know, sometimes we must think about. <clears throat> and my friend said, no, this, I didn't know this. When women give birth, the placenta, the cord blood, mother can donate those immature stem cells. And these things find a way. You put it in IV and they find, like his bursitis, his bursa sac was gone. Full range of motion in that arm now. Through an IV stem cell, it found his uh, elbow, it found the pain in his head and so forth. So I invited this guy to be on TV, and he's a wealth of knowledge. Now, a chiropractor, look, long story short, the guy gets in a head-on, no, it's not true, T-boned, um, 
in his car, a 70 mile an hour car, really messed him up. And I asked him on TV, what does a chiropractor do when you can't fix a subluxation, when you can't manipulate or, you know, uh, fix your own spine? And he said, I was stuck with that. I had a friend in uh, Florida who told me about stem cells. And I never thought I'd walk again. Nobody did. Went out to Florida, and the bottom line is he fixed it. How did he fix it? Okay, we went on about this. So I asked him the question because John, some time ago, had left knee pain. And we used to work out the knee and jog and so forth, and it got better, but it never improved. So a friend of mine who's a doctor said, John, you need to do stem cells. What I do is go into your spine and take some cells, and then I recirculate them, autogenous. I make an autogenous vaccine, put your stem cells back in you. And so we inquired about that. But folks, one of the problems with that is, by the time you're 80 years old, you don't have any stem cells. Placental cord blood, which mothers are saying, hey, I'd like to help someone with migraines or back pain or knee pain. See if these baby stem cells, I don't need them any longer. See if uh, somebody will benefit from this. <clears throat> so I asked a couple of questions of Dr. Brunk, and I want to, look, after the show is over, go to our website. Look up advertisers, our advertisers, our sponsors, we call them. You can get his information on there. But I want those of you who are living in chronic pain, this isn't aborted fetuses. This is brand new birthed babies whose mom said, I'm donating my placenta, my cord blood, to these doctors who are doing stem cells. Brilliant idea. Meet with me now for the next minute, minute and a half, Dr. Darcy Brunk. Teach us a little bit about stem cells. Do we all have them? Yes, we do. We all have stem cells. It's what we're born with. It's what builds us. Matter of fact, at birth, one in 10,000 cells are stem cells. Then we go through 90% of those to build our structure, to become the person, the body structure we are. What happens from there is a decrease and decline as we age. It's why when we hit our 40s, uh, we, we're more prone, we're trying to get in shape and we may have a meniscal tear. But by the time we're 80, they're down to one in two million. So it makes sense then why we are more prone to infections, we're more prone to diseases, and we, we just don't repair as quickly. Tell me about how you came into stem cells. So I came into stem cells from an injury. I was in a car accident. We got hit at 70 miles an hour, a massive impact. It was terrible. All the things I knew how to do, and I was just 50%. I wasn't able to work. It was a career-ending injury. And I found infinity cells, which are a type of stem cell, and it helped my body to repair itself and restore itself so it could I could get back into work. But as a chiropractor, I've been watching degeneration. I've been managing that for people, and for the first time, regeneration. So what I had to do was come back in and partner with a medical doctor, nurse practitioners, and physician's assistants to deliver infinity therapy. So he's got a, do we all have stem cells, right? He's got a team, he's got a physician, a physician's assistant, and so forth that assist him in doing this right out here near the airport in Dallas. But he also has a crew, I don't know all the places, I think he said Louisiana, Florida. He's got crews that do this for him. This man is sold out on stem cells. Now, here's one thing you need to know. Uh, I looked up before I ever took, we do vetting. The reason I have 20, 25-year advertisers on my show is because I do some lead-in studies. Uh, I really want to know about the person. I want to know about the technology and so forth. I have had stem cell advertisers in years past talk to me, but when I heard stem cells, I'm sorry. I just thought the wrong stuff. I wasn't aware of technology. But when my friend, uh, the politician, uh, met me the other day and said, I'm headache-free, and he said, he said, stem cells, and I said, let me tell you why I don't like that. And he said, no, Doug, welcome to 2020. Um, it's much different now. They don't use uh, aborted fetuses. So I said, do tell. Then I looked up, my next problem, John knows it, was I looked up stem cell, insurance doesn't pay for it. You got to write a check for it or put it on your credit card. So I start looking on the internet, various stem cell companies, 8,000, 20,000, eight, no, eight to $18,000, somewhere in there. 
So I talked with Dr. Brunk. Um, John, what did he say? Uh, uh, 3,500, uh, depending on how long you've had the problem, how much therapy is needed and so forth, probably uh, three to $5,000, somewhere in there. That's doable for some people. I thank God I don't have pain. Okay, I'm gonna rest it there, but I'm gonna mention Dr. Brunk more often because it's amazing, folks, what stem cells can do. Some people take them for youthfulness. Um, some people, and these things find, this is how amazing God is. These things find their way to tissues that are bad. This is like a book that never ends when you begin to study stem cells the way I have recently. So I want to introduce you to my new best friend, Dr. Darcy Brunk, and he's right out here in Dallas. By the way, if you want to talk to him, uh, he does 10-minute consult, 15-minute consult. He doesn't charge for. Um, he'll be happy to talk with you. And as he told me at lunch the other day, Doug, a lot of the times I talk people out of them. It's not going to benefit them. So what have you got to lose? Okay, at any rate, I did that. Now I want to talk to you about overdiagnosis. Thursday's show is going to be dedicated to hyperdiagnosis, overdiagnosing a disease we call cancer. I think diabetes is overdiagnosed. I think Alzheimer's. I think neurological diseases, be they autism or Parkinson's, are very often hyperdiagnosed. And let me give you my take very gently on this. <clears throat> I've been in this field and I've been fascinated by it by almost a half a century. Um, well, it's not true. 1968, I began core school, military core school. So 20, you know, 50 years, 52 years. Um, and I've been in battle, you know that. I, I've been in operating rooms. I've been in recovery rooms. I've worked in emergency rooms. And uh, sometimes we place on a pedestal the entire field of medicine. I don't think they like it. I think science, those screaming science right now, are the very ones who don't understand science was much different in 2019, and it will be far advanced if we will allow it, unless we allow this year to stall it. Um, science will be far beyond where it is in 2020, here in a few years. So people who scream science are usually scientists who believe they know it all. Very, very few people know it all, right? One I know of, okay? So I want to talk to you a little bit about what I think is going on. Remember, this is my uh, brain telling you this. I made a note, April 7th, a couple of months ago, April, May, June, July, three months ago. Dr. Burke says government is classifying all deaths of patients with coronavirus as COVID-19 deaths, regardless of their cause. Admission that we were hyper-diagnosing COVID. Were is the operative word. Are we still? Day before yesterday, I get this. Florida officials admitting counting a motorcycle death as COVID-19 fatality. Remove it from the list after media scrutiny. Um, okay, so here's one for you. I'm going to put my doctor hat on. Here's a 20-year-old kid on a motorcycle, sad because I love motorcycles. I don't know how old he was, but he gets hit by a car or something and he dies. Be careful on motorcycles. Take home uh, statement. But when they did a uh, post-mortem exam, they draw blood. You know, was he drinking alcohol? Was he on drugs, et cetera? And they're now, I'm certain, doing a COVID on anything that has life in it. You know, probably trees. Um, so they did a, a COVID test on this guy, and uh, they found after he was dead that he had COVID in his blood. And they're doing this on people with pneumonia who die, and they're doing it on stroke and cardiovascular event patients. They're doing it on 80, 82, 87, 90 year old people who die. And if per chance, I just need you to know this, if per chance they have a concomitant problem, they didn't know they had it because they're asymptomatic. We'll talk about that too. When they die, every place in the world, they didn't used to do this. Guy gets in on a motorcycle, sad, they bury him. Everything has to be COVID tested now, okay? Could I put on my medical hat? Doug, how do you know 
that this young kid wasn't speeding to an emergency room because he just found out he had COVID and he blanked out and his motorcycle spun. I, I don't. I almost, I hate to admit this, but I almost see the medical model. I almost see allopathic medicine saying, what's wrong with that, Doug? Here's a guy, 82 years old, dies of, I am convinced most pneumonia is fungal. And yet 100% of these people go on antibiotics. It's not bacteria, okay? But if it were, they're on antibiotics. And an antibiotics increase the risk of many illnesses, including cancer but they're in a hospital. COVID's coming in everywhere in a hospital, right? No socomial infections, you can look it up, no socomial infections exist in medical settings, doctor's offices, hospitals, medical clinics, because of the air ducts. Somebody just came in here with a burn, a, a horrible burn on his arm. Well, Pseudomonas bacteria, right, is picked up in that duct, and then we breathe it, okay? so. I've tried to stay out of medical settings as much as I could after I got back from Vietnam. Of course, then I ended up working with various doctors. I've had a ball. Not much time in hospitals, but time in medical clinics, okay? So here you have a case of a guy who gets killed on a motorcycle and he dies of COVID. Did any of you see, I, I watched it on Facebook the other day. I've got to be more careful on Facebook. You guys are cracking me up. The guy jumping out of the parachute without the uh, guy jumping out of the guy jumping out of an airplane without his parachute on hits the ground, dies of COVID. Well, that's what happened here. How strange does this sound? A young kid in a motorcycle accident dies of COVID-19. Arguably, there's a case to make there. Reasonably, the guy was in a motorcycle accident, but they're testing everything that lay down for him right now. Why? Why does some force, why does someone want us to be tied down and handcuffed this way? Speaking of handcuffs, you probably also saw this. Couple under house arrest after refusing to sign COVID-19 quarantine agreement. Louisiana couple, they're just the cutest couple. The husband looked to me like a bear. Great big guy, they have a child, just awesome couple. Um, but she went to visit her grandma or something, and when she came home, the rule was you'll get a COVID test. What is going on? When you come home, you'll get a COVID test. Had a COVID test, it came back positive. Let me read you why she wouldn't sign the agreement. Now, I don't know if this is Tennessee. Were they in Nashville? Louisville, Kentucky. I'm sorry. Louisville, Kentucky. Here's why she refused to sign it. Number six, there was ten things you have to do. It reminds me of in Vietnam, we wore masks all day. We got helicopters landing, guys without arms and legs. and We were sewing them all together. And, but they were paper masks, and when you'd sweat through it, you'd put a new one on. Okay? Uh, this is just different. But it feels like somebody's leading me around. I'm a smart guy. You're smart. If you walk into a room and you sense people are uncomfortable because nine of them, of the ten, you're the only one, aren't, are wearing masks, put a mask on. Okay? Um, I don't need somebody to tell me to put a mask on. But everybody's not Doug Kaufman or you. And some people are bullies. And so that might be, I'm going to put my doctor hat back on, that might be a reason to mask up, okay? With the exception of last night, I normally have my mask on. Here's number six, why this young woman wouldn't sign this. She declined to sign because of one sentence. I will not travel by any public, commercial, or health care conveyance, such as an ambulance. I can't get in an ambulance. What if my child gets hit by a car? Can't get in an ambulance. Bus, taxi, airplane, train, boat, without the prior approval of the Department of Health. Hello, my six-year-old daughter is having a convulsion in bed, a grand mal seizure in bed. Well, hold please. Do 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 do. Hold please. Do do do. What is happening? What kind of an attorney would have written that? Her husband has a heart attack. 
So now they're in, <laughs> they're in ankle. They're making the best of a horrible situation. They have these ankle monitors on. And if you leave, John, you hit it right today when we were uh, having our lunch. There's going to be a million of these things going off if they impose this, which, why not? We got them wearing masks. We got them standing in line. You know, we got them only buying this. We got them believing coins are gone. Why not put them, you know, why not put them in ankle lockers, lockets? Um, so the bottom line to this is, folks, here's, if I were this woman, here's what I'd do. Answer me this. How accurate was that test I had? Shh. Ho, 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 ho. The lawyers and the doctors, whoa, ho, ho, don't go there. That was very, I'm reading things, folks, in the last couple of months. Oh, these new tests are 96% accurate. Okay, we've done 20 million of them. Do the math times 4%. But I'm telling you, sometimes medicine doesn't give us the true story. You've, of course, watched on my show the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine lying, lying. Two medical journals publishing an article that declared that hydroxychloroquine was dangerous and had no value. And then the magazines had to retract because they published false data. This isn't new in medicine. This goes on, in my humble opinion, I worked in doctor's offices. I saw the detail men and women go in and give free samples and take them to lunch and try and give me a pizza and a Coke. You know, ain't happening. So I pulled out this from a couple of months ago. This is uh, May 14th, June, July, uh, May, June, July, so two months ago. FDA cautions, this is on NPR. FDA cautions about accuracy of widely used Abbott coronavirus test. Did this girl have the Abbott? Do we know, folks? We're just drones, you know. Um, the FDA is cautioning the public about the reliability of a widely used rapid test for coronavirus. Da eight weeks ago. The test made by Abbott Laboratories has been linked with inaccurate results that could falsely um, reassure patients that they are not infected with the virus. False negatives. Uh, the tr and I know it's NPR because the next sentence, the Trump administration has promoted this test as a key factor in control. I wonder if Trump stood up there and said, Abbott Laboratories has a great test. I don't know, but that's what this paper says, okay? Bias. The first report, uh, as first report on NPR, as many as 15 to 20 out of every 100 tests may produce falsely negative results. The study released this week indicated that the test could be missing as many as 48% of infections. Medically speaking, pretty good test. 48% positive, negative. Folks, I need you to know this. I'm being a bit crude, but I need you, I've said this on TV now for 22 years, all isn't okay in the halls of science. We have a man who I don't know running this who has flipped positions several times. Wear a mask, don't wear a mask. Take hydroxychloroquine, sure, it works. He published it works. A few years later, doesn't work. And he's the top gun. All, I don't want to demean. I don't want to say anything wrong here. I'm sure he's smarter than me. Uh, we have to be careful. Please be careful out there. If I can get away with it, I'm not going to take a test. Because you know what? I have this fear. Have you guys ever watched Forensic Files? My sister, one of my best friends, my sister, sometimes 8.30 at night, She'll text, I can't believe he did it with a rake. <laughs> it's my sister. Did you watch Forensic Files last night? I can't believe he did it. So the one thing I learned on Forensic Files is this. They're always searching for forensic material. Um, scraping, you know, buccal, right? Get a little scrape on your cheek, they got your DNA. 
And then I saw one, uh, my sister and I were talking about, where they couldn't get a guy, they gave him a bottle of water in the exam room, they were talking to him, they were sure he did it, but he wouldn't throw the bottle away, nor the cup, he took it with him. They couldn't get DNA on him. Then one day, he's working out at the shop, he lights a cigarette, and uh, he looks around and uh, throws the cigarette butt on the ground. Ta-da, he goes back in, the investigators go up, get the cigarette butt, and he's guilty of murder because his DNA was linked to the murdered person's DNA, or uh, his DNA was all over the murdered person. Do you see where I'm going with this? They're shoving back in to your DNA, or you can spit. Data gathering is what the big industry boys seem to have a love affair with right now. They want your data. I think 50 million of us have given us our data. I may be wrong, I hope I am. But it certainly is good for, you know, talk television and talk radio. Just ponder that. I, I'm just really... <clears throat> okay, let's do this. I've, uh, one more. Let me start with this. I want to read you something out of a, this is nanotechnology biomedicine on phys.org, P-H-Y-S, um, which is probably physician.org. Nanotech in your vitamins. The ability of the FDA to regulate the safety of dietary supplements using nanomaterials is severely limited by lack of information, lack of resources, and the agency's lack of statutory authority in certain critical areas, according to a new report. Little is known about the use of engineered nanoparticles in dietary supplements. A report entitled, A Hard Pill to Swallow, Barriers to Effective FDA Regulations on Nanotechnology-Based Dietary Supplements detail the main problems the FDA is having, you know, overseeing this industry. Hey, nano-curcumin, nano-silver. This was uh, 10 years ago. Now, folks, nanotechnology seems to be the way to go, but only in medicine, not in supplements. Oh, boy, thank you, John. Uh, okay, away we go. Okay, here's the headline, hot off the press. COVID-19 replicating RNA vaccine has robust response. Robust response. And then you keep going in non-human primates. Wow, we can immunize and vaccinate every monkey in the world. Does it work on humans? We don't know. But it's a robust response. University of Washington, I was there. I love that place. A replicating RNA vaccine formulated with a lipid-based nanoparticle emulsion produces antibodies against COVID-19 coronavirus in mice and primates with a single immunization. Now, so I did a little more work. The vaccine induces T cells, a type of white blood cells that provide the second line of defense if antibodies don't completely block the infection. Nanotechnology. This replicating RNA vaccine contains the novel liquid inorganic nanoparticle uh, called Lion, L-I-O-N, developed by a Seattle-based company. Nanoparticle, folks, and they're all... Uh, Next generation vaccine from University of Washington researchers show promise in fighting COVID-19. Nanotechnology, you told us that was bad in our supplements. The FDA couldn't, re yeah, but this is medicine and it's important that we all get a vaccine. Okay. Um, candidly, I don't think they're gonna be able to do it. I have a track record to base that statement on. For 10 years, the flu vaccine has been, and I'm going to quote the Center for Disease Control, has been between 19 and 60 percent effective. And those numbers are their numbers. I don't think the flu shot works, okay? Along comes a totally different, an RNA vaccine. And we're, see, here's my problem. There's a couple at home in Louisville, Kentucky right now with ankle bracelets on. 
because they refused to sign something. I don't know where this is going, but I think scientists at the top, and they're giddy, are saying, there, don't worry, there's 140 companies working on this vaccine. We're funding billions of dollars, your tax dollars, for this vaccine. And I just need to, to tell you this. There's 330 million people in the U.S. 0.002% of them have died from this flu virus. Do we need a vaccine? If children went back to school, we could touch dollar bills and nickels and dimes. Herd immunity would soon build up to the point where I think this thing would disappear. Just my take, always listen to the experts, okay? Now, on to your uh, questions. Thank you so much for them. Understand I'm not a doctor. I'm gonna try and point you into the right direction. Uh, usually it's gonna be along the lines of a dietary problem, a fungal problem, etc. Can I just thank you from my heart? I don't know if you guys see the numbers on what's happening to this uh, show, but thank you. I had no idea two years ago of the success of it. Uh, many of you, I know there are, I know with certainty there are four doctors watching this right now. I couldn't count the school teachers or nurses. Um, but thank you for going in and helping me. Your assistance is better, often better than mine would have been answering the question. I mean, you guys are amazing. Oh, yeah, Paul, this is a good one. Paul says, hey, Doug, how are you doing? Great. Did you see the video of the African president that uh, sent three supposed blood samples uh, to the World Health Organization, but it was goat blood mixed with papaya and another fruit, and they all came back positive for uh, Corona-19? What's going on here? Mm, Paul, first of all, let me tell you, because we have venues like I'm on right now, Facebook, YouTube, it's an open forum. And sometimes people mean so well, but they hear from, did you, Paul, ever play? I, we used to play this with my cousins. There were five of them, there were five of us. So by the time we all got of age, we'd whisper at the dinner table something. I'm not going to eat this meat. And by the time it got to the 10th person, it was, we're all going to the beach. That's kind of what this open venue allows us to do, is misconstrue what the original statements were. And then there are just people I have found who mean well on these venues, but they're not accurate, okay? Um, I don't know if that, I haven't done any fact, look, where do we go to fact search anymore, okay? Think about that one, that's a huge problem. I wish someone would start a fact search, a brilliant fact search. Um, so yes, I heard about that. I've laughed about it. Listen, I laugh constantly. Otherwise, I'd come on here with a box of Kleenex. I can't believe last Christmas, we were in Napa in these beautiful cabins at the top of a mountain. It started snowing on us in California. It was beautiful, kids, grandkids. Weeks later, here we are. What's going on, Paul? Why is this going on? Who thinks this is good for America? Because we've got to question this. Is this really a horrible virus that's pandemic? I've told you, Cambodia, Laos, Vietnam, Japan has under 1,000 deaths, and they have 90 million people. How come just in America? it grew legs and it got so bad. And we built respirators and we put hospital ships and we built hospitals on land, private land, and we didn't need any of them. What's going on here? I'm not a genius, but watching what's going on here is amazing to me. And I think we just have to, folks, I think we have to do our best work on our knees. There's one person that knows what's going on here. And in the end, the truth will prevail. And the lies, if there are lies, will fail. Okay? So, Paul, thank you. Great, great start. 
Hi, Doug. Do you think uh, they changed the name from coronavirus to COVID-19? Why do you think? Oh, there's so many. Oh, I've read some good ones. It, it, COVID is an acronym for da 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 and it was the end of 2019. You know, I, I've read them all. Uh, I don't know. I remember when the coronavirus came out, and I'm going to stick to what I said. I'm probably one of the few people who five months, six months later, has stuck to what I said initially. Either we are going to realize uh, that our medical community has a cap on their knowledge or something very sinister is going on. Could it be both? Sure. I just don't know. But when I see there are some bold doctors and nurses who have come out and uh, then disappeared. I don't mean disappeared, disappeared. I mean, then they've taken down, you know, all their information. Were they wrong? I don't know. I don't know. I am so happy that I'm able to talk with you. And I'm a guy who thanks Facebook. And I'm a guy who thanks YouTube and everywhere else this show goes. Because we've got a lot of followers, a lot of very bright followers, who probably are thinking the same way I am. Uh, so boils popping up all over my body. They could be bacterial sacs. They could be ascomycetes. I would get to a doctor, have him excise one of them, grow out what it is inside. Um, very often, Janet, I've got to tell you, when you change your diet, you change your physiology. You tra change your acid alkaline uh, uh, base. If you're very, very acid, for example, your pH is 5.5 and you want to get up to 7.0, a change in diet, remember, greens, alkaline, grains, acid. Are you eating cereal and bagels, lots of pasta, wheat, whole wheat? I'm not saying it is. It could be responsible. It's so fascinating to me that doctors in their medical training don't learn this. Wow. What a problem. You can't talk diet. I'll mention this again on Thursday, but if I forget, let me tell you now. There is this great guy on WebMD. WebMD is a pharmaceutical website or a medical website. <clears throat> He's an oncologist, and I used his story in front of all these doctors when I lectured the past uh, couple of years. He said, I sit with these patients. I look at where they're injured. I want to hug them. My heart breaks for them. I go home every night and just say thank you. Um, and he said, I can just dance with them about the chemotherapy drugs. I can just dance with them about radiation, oral versus IV chemo. I can just dance with them. And then he said, but inevitably, every patient who comes in that door asks me about supplements and diet family, hypercholesterolemia, too much cholesterol in your blood, we've been telling them to stay off of fats. Don't eat nuts. Don't eat avocados. Oh, coconut's going to kill you. And eat a lot of carbs. Well, we were wrong. <sighs> Sorry. This is the way medicine gets done, folks. Very slow. I've been at this 50 years trying to teach about fungus. Ah, not there. Okay. Finally, and Connie was so cute the other day, I just, I just love Connie when she goes on and starts talking about this. You probably all saw this paper, Coronavirus Pandemic Update, Fungi and COVID-19, Researchers Begin Probe as Virus Patients Die of Fungus. Hmm. Now, they're finding, look, Aspergillus mold has 60, at least 60 different species. Aspergillus parasiticus, Aspergillus flavus, both of those make aflatoxin that causes human cancer. But there are others. And, and this one was called Aspergillus latus. Sounds like a latte, right? I look it up. It's a soil-based organism. It's an Aspergillus. And they're finding people dying. When they die, they do COVID testing. And apparently, they're starting to do fungal testing. Thank you. And pretty soon, they might find Histoplasma capsulatum which was picked up in a bat cave in Wuhan by virologists, I think taken back to their virology lab, and a marriage took place. Those viruses are really cute. Whoa, look the way they're dressed. 
wow, those fungi are tall and handsome. I'm saying it happens. It's called genetic fusion. It happens. And it would fly under the radar if people's education was void in mycology. No doctor would be able to figure this one out. Okay, and I may be wrong, but at least it's Doug's hypotheses, right? Okay, good questions. My friend Ann, I love hearing from her. Hey, Doug, it's a stormy day in the mountains. Nice haircut, Doug. <laughs> I'm baking apple dumplings today. Not for me, LOL, but for my family. Sending prayers and blessings from our family to yours. Ann lives this incredible life. Wow, apple dumplings. Can you imagine the smell of her home? Way up probably six, 7,000 feet in the air. Oh, uh, thank you. Uh, Margaret asks, what's a good source of natural antifungals? You know, the more I read, I took a course in herbology with a friend of mine. He's a physician years ago. It's after I first got here, so it was probably five years into my being here. So it may be almost 30 years ago. I took a course in herbology. Ah, because David Weekly, the doctor I came to visit with, died. Uh, horrible death, and I found myself wanting to continue helping patients. I couldn't do his anymore because he had died. Thank you, John. <laughs> um, yeah, there it was a smart audience. Uh, when he died, I couldn't get Diflucan, Nystatin, Spornox, Lamisil, Amphotericin B. I couldn't get antifungal drugs anymore. I had him convinced everything was fungus because he saw the patients. They were getting better. Um, so I, ha I, I learned that there were a few herbs, you know, clove, uh, spices, uh, oregano, had powerful antifungal. So I went through this course, and it was a long way. It took me an hour to get there somewhere in Fort Worth. And uh, it was one of the most important courses I ever went through because all these things, m the majority of herbs, spices, uh, minerals, zinc, have antifungal properties. Um, it just, it boggles my mind. And as I began lecturing to doctors, I had to find out. You've heard the word phenolic compounds, phenol. So plants have phenolic compounds, like spinach, plants we eat. Phenolic compounds or polyphenol, many phenolic compounds bound together, it means much antimicrobial activity. Uh, and so when you eat antifungals, antibacterials, and you take them, and you're not living in a moldy home, um, and you're drinking fresh water, good clean water, like Anne is, um, and you're taking and you're exercising your body. My last question: I had a one-year anatomy and physiology course at Santa Monica College when I got back from Vietnam, so it would have been 1971, 72. The teacher had us rotate desks, and he'd put a, a radius and ulnar. He'd put the mandible maxilla joint. You know, how do these two fit together? What is temporomandibular joint disease? And the last question on the test was, what have you learned about the human body this year? It was a one-year course. I, th I may have gotten an A in that. Uh, I was into science then. Man, what I saw in Vietnam, when you see open people, whoa, that's what the lungs look like? You know, and I worked in the operating room for many of those months. So I had this passion for medicine. I wanted to be a doctor, uh, but God had a different idea. But the last question was, what have you learned about the human body this past year? I got it half right. I was laughing with some of my, uh, the others in the class. I put, it's cool. What have I learned? You know what the answer was? It moves. He was a muscular, good-looking young professor. Um, this guy worked out constantly, and uh, he, he laughed. You know, you got a half right. It's cool. It is cool. But it moves, and we don't. This is the most exercise most of us get. Think, you guys, especially during these tough times. It's so easy to eat those apple dumplings. 
it's so easy to go to the store, you're in there quick, you don't want to hang around with a mask on, and so you pull some sweets out. It's easy to do that, but it's never too late to know you're craving that because in your HVAC ducting system, you got a mold that you've inhaled. It's aspergillus or penicillium or fusarium or stachybotrys. You've got a mold that you're now feeding and it's dictating what you eat. So exercise, sweat it out. And if you're fortunate like me and you have a pool, drop in it uh, after a hard workout. Good source of natural antifungals. Uh, vitamin, actually a B, multi-B vitamin, which I got from uh, Life Extension is probably $12, loaded with antifungals. The B vitamins, niacin, folate, etc. cetera. Uh, so that's a good one. Vitamin D3 from sunlight. Uh, or take, I take 5,000 IU of vitamin D3. Um, quercetin, and the list is resveratrol, and the list is endless. Limonene, you know, uh, caprylic acid, lauric acid, zinc. It, it's literally, one time a guy in o Oklahoma City had me on his radio show, and he said, when we walked in that health food store last night, how many antifungals were there in there? And I said, well, they had food. So all of it, all of it. You know, you can't eat the jars that stuff comes in and so forth, but antifungals, you'd be surprised if you really study fungal mycotoxins and food-based organisms. Uh, you'd just be surprised. You shouldn't be shocked. If you're a believer, God did it right. If we make a mistake, eat green leafy vegetables, okay? Eat grapefruit. That's what my story is all about, and I'm going to stick with it. Such good questions. Oh, how are my eye floaters? I think they're gone. Uh, Steve, Steve, it's my buddy Steve. This guy's intense. I, I love this guy. I get letters from him. Um, I'm concerned for you. Royal Rife's machine has been purportedly highly successful in treating and curing cancer, or does it kill fungus instead? There are frequencies which zap fungus. Royal Rife, this poor guy got the rug pulled out. Steve, you know this. Um, the old original Rife microscopes. You know what, Steve? You and I know too much. Um, Rife, uh, Royal Rife contended that with frequencies, he could go in and zap uh, pathogenic organisms from our body. And apparently, he had a pretty good track record of doing it. Now, I wasn't there, Steve. I don't know. I've read. Um, but I think frequencies are the wave of the future. And if you get my drift, they're here now. Used appropriately, I think they're you guys, Steve, you guys, do you remember Ella Fitzgerald? You remember that, um, that ad on TV? What was the name of the, ta the, the tape company? Is it real or is it Memorex? They'd plug in a cassette tape and they had a glass and Ella Fitzgerald hit a note and the glass broke. And I remember I'm a kid back then thinking, okay, that's kind of fascinating. That's true. If it can break glass, can it break a pathogenic bacteria or fungus? I believe so. If used inappropriately, we better all be careful. Okay? Um, okay, good questions. <laughs> He's seen you. Uh, something, uh, something suggests I have a biopsy on my lungs. I have heard it can spread. Is that true? What do you think of Gerson's therapy? So I've lectured for years and years with Gerson therapists, her daughter, her son, they're very bright. Gerson therapy is, of course, eating oils, um, cottage cheese mixed with various and sundry oils and so forth. Look, you can't fight with success. Gerson therapy has been wonderful. Now, Yesenia, let's talk about this. I think you're saying an oncologist suggests I have a biopsy on my lungs. I've heard that it can spread. Two schools of thought. Uh, know what scientists say, Yesenia. They say no. Biopsies don't spread or don't turn a 
dormant tumor into a metastasizing tumor. They don't believe that what's in that sac will transfer to other cells. My question is, <clears throat> thank you, thank you, John. What, what you're going to watch right there is a colon biopsy, and they just took a, some tissue biopsy out, and now you're going to see blood coming out of where they took the tissue. And folks, that's surrounded by other tissue. Those blood cells are going to be picked up and or whatever was in that lump in that person's colon. Okay, was it fungus? Was it bacteria? Does the blood now carry this into new organs? I don't know. I'm the wrong guy, you see, you because I'm totally biased. I've written on this. I've published on this. So um, why can't we ask the doctor, could you do a surgery and take the lump out of my lung? Yasenia, have you seen a pulmonologist? Has the pulmonologist recommended a bronchoscopy? A bronchoscopy is going to kind of give this away. They can test for fungus. They must test for fungus. And a friend of mine who's doing this right now, uh, one hour from here, is a physician, board certified in both internal medicine and uh, uh, pulmonology. He has found 70 to 80 percent of the patients he handed antibiotics out, like candy years ago, didn't have a bacteria in their lungs at all. Some, he has found an aspergilloma, a fungal ball in their lungs, but it looks just like cancer. So I think if I were you, Yesenia, I would find a doctor to do a bronchoscopy. So they anesthetize you quickly, put a tube into the lungs, pull it out, and look for fungus. If there's fungus in there, could this not be cancer? Could it be treated with four or five months of diet, of uh, antifungal drugs? Spornox has been used for lung cancer now. It's a toenail fungus drug. So uh, you're asking the wrong guy, and I need to admit this to you. I would be biased. Um, ask the right guy. Find a pulmonologist, get a bronchoscopy done, tell him. It needs to be tested for fungi and their mycotoxins. Good. Um, okay, so uh, this is Anne. Howdy, Doug. On your last on your last week's show, I asked about Flex, and you directed me to their site. I researched and liked what I read, and placed an order, purchased the tri package along with the cream. I have that in my counter at home. In a short time, I've been using Flex, and I surely have noticed a significant difference. You know what? We got to call Tamar and uh, read this to him, John. That's really a good testimonial for him. I love. Remember, John used to get the topical. He would. John lifts an ungodly amount of weight, 400 pounds, and by squeezing that bar and doing his workouts, his hands were so sore. So we gave him a bottle of uh, Flexin. And man, it, it, right, John? Yeah, you need to go down to 80 pounds, John, I think. I'm just jealous. It was four, it's not 400? Oh, 350, you wimp. I lifted 350 pounds. You know, it was 60 pounds six times, but I can do that. Uh, thank you. That's a great testimonial. I will share that with the president of Flexen. Tommy, my buddy Tommy from England. I've been helping people from the Kaufman Community Facebook page to build their strength through resistance training. This is what Tommy knows better than anyone. Working remotely alongside your diet and lifestyle, it's a match made in heaven. Tommy, I've never met Tommy. I've communicated with him. Uh, thank you, Tommy. Folks, uh, you can trust this guy. I've communicated with him. He's very good, very good at what he does. Hey, Doug, I think I'm growing uh, fungus under my fingernails. What do you recommend to get rid of it? K, if it's... Uh, mm. So there's a subungual melanoma. You all need to know about it. Subungual melanoma means melanoma cancer under your fingernails. There are striations that exist. Your nail will turn black or very dark colors, and there's three or four stripes in the nail. The point I want to make is I'm not a doctor. I can't see your nail. Um, I, I always will recommend getting to a doctor and ruling out anything 
that may be worse than onychomycosis, which is simple nail fungus. Um, the doctor may recommend, by the way, the treatment for subungual uh, melanoma is sporinox, right? Uh, and the treatment for fungus is sporinox. If this is fungus, if the doctor says, yeah, that's just a simple fungus, I would use uh, camphor oils. I would use Vicks VapoRub. It's going to take a few months, but before you go to bed in the evening, rub a little on, get under the cute or get under the nail real well, and watch what happens a couple months into doing that. Now, when you get out of the shower, blow dry. You're blow drying your hair, blow dry under your fingernail, and that finger very thoroughly moisture helps fungus proliferate. Uh, hi from Nova Scotia. Causing cures for baby eczema, according to Doug, smile. Baby is eight months old, still breastfeeding. Good. Thank God the baby's breastfeeding. Uh, so eczema, this fungus is just, I would get a test plate at any store, a mold test plate, set it out in the baby's room, um, and see if mold is a problem in that room. Yeah, follow the directions, you'll know in a few days. Mold can induce skin changes, dermal layer changes. Um, now, if not, then look at some natural, you know, the one thing they've always said about omega-3 fatty acids is how it helps with dermatitis, many kinds of skin conditions. It kills fungus, well documented. How do I get it to a baby? Rub a little on the nipple, open a little capsule, put it on your finger, rub it on the nipple, and the baby will latch on. Uh, always check with the pediatrician first, but uh, we used to ask women, uh, nursing moms whose babies had thrush, if we could compound nystatin, and it would come dry, it takes the glue out of the nystatin, the little tablets and so forth, and you just wet a finger, put it around the nipple, and the baby latches on, boom. I mean, it was so exciting to, to work with moms who would just come in and high-five me. Um, thank you for watching from Canada. Uh, ta -ta 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 uh, my question for you, please help me. Has Candida evolved a resistance to Nystatin Diflucan so that it comes back even stronger when you stop? Also, do those medications cause severe die-off? Uh, been there, done that, very cautious now. Thank you so much. Yeah. Germs are smart. They'll outthink any medication, any therapy. Living healthy is a constant goal of mine, even at 70 years old. And here's what I've learned in the past 50 years. You will never, you'll be buried with your germs. Eventually they win, they take you down. Living well is to be actively antimicrobial, actively antivirus, active